Good morning. How's everybody doing? So welcome to uh, kind of a deep dive into Astara. Uh, my name is uh, Mark McLean. I'm one the co-founder and CTO of Aconda, which provides services and support um, around the OpenStack Astara project. Uh, previously, I served on the technical committee for a couple years, as well as former Neutron PTL. Um, so I, I think when a lot of people wonder, like, what is Astara? What were the challenges for it? Um, you know, why did we go off and write Astara? Why did we not do this inside Neutron? And so kind of want to touch on those a little bit today. Um, and so when we started taking a look at it, um, Astara as a project was born um, from the time when I was working at DreamHost with some others and, you know, from the public cloud use case and, you know, how can we solve the operational need? So when we started taking a look at it, you know, when you're running a cloud, um, you're going to have multiple services. You're going to have, you know, each SDN, L2 is going to be a little bit different. They're kind of difficult to change. Um, you know, in some respects, if you take a look at Neutron with like ML2, you can change some bits. Um, but if you say have a monolithic driver, it can actually be a little bit more interesting um, if you're changing your provider over time. And, and one of the things is when we were designing um, the public cloud there is that we knew that services and vendors were going to evolve over time. Um, it's just a fact of life when, you know, when running and operations and really day two matters. Um, and so taking a look at it, those are some of the operational challenges we were trying to solve. But also you kind of have to balance that with, you know, could we have attacked some problems in Neutron? And yes, we did in some places. And other places were like, you know, we don't, this isn't a Neutron problem. This is an operational problem. This is an implementation problem, not something that is, you know, needs to go be fixed in Neutron because really nothing's broken in that area. And so kind of keep that in mind. You know, it's like where we did things differently, it's just because we had a different opinion and that's okay because when you realistically take a look at, you know, how Neutron's constructed, I mean, you can have a wide variety of solutions that solve a lot of different unique use cases and it doesn't invalidate another particular solution. So, you know, I just, you know, one of the takeaways is, you know, make sure it's not that, you know, what Neutron did with its implementations is wrong. It's just that for certain use cases, it didn't match up with what we wanted. And so, you know, that's the good part about experimentation. It's the good part about an open ecosystem is that we can borrow and share and use different ideas. So, you know, logical Neutron, it's clean. You know, you can make these nice pretty diagrams. I can log in Horizon, and, you know, now the diagram bounces, it moves around, it gives me all kind of cool stuff. But underneath the hood, it's a little messy you know, what's actually going on? How are we handling layer two? How are we handling layer three? You know, should we, when writing systems, handle layer two or layer three? And so when coming with that for Astara, we made a conscious effort, uh, a conscious decision to say, you know, we're going to be layer two agnostic. You know, we think there's lots of solutions out there that do layer two fairly well, you know, whether it's OVS or Linux Bridge, um, we also preferred, you know, when you start talking about day two operations in terms of technical staff and operations to keep, um, to use standard tooling. Um, you know, some of the SDN solutions that do layer two and layer three converge are very interesting, um, you know, and, and provide a lot of benefit, but we decided to take a little bit different and really kind of respect the layers within the network stack so that you have each layer is kind of doing it what it specialized best at. Um, so with that, the Astara project was born. Um, a star, if you're wondering, is basically kind of uh, like a callback to the escape prototype name. Originally, this project, uh, when we started it, was nicknamed The Rug. If you've ever seen the movie The Big Lebowski, um, there's a line in the movie about tying the room together. A star loosely translates into carpet. Um, so that's how the kind of the lineage of the project name. So within that, like I said, this came from the public cloud use case. So we wanted it to be hyperscalable. We knew we were going to have a large number of endpoints. Um, we knew we needed to, it was going to be supersized. It needed to be highly available. Um, we also knew that we wanted to deliver services over the top. Um, so specifically layer three and above services. We also knew that over time, uh, wanted to have provisions to grow that set of services so that it was easy to add them, easy to integrate them. Yet, because, it's, because it was born out of the public cloud use case, open, you know, maintain those open source APIs, you know, standard Neutron, standard Nova, standard Glance, you know. If you write extensions, it makes it really hard on the tooling. Your customers can't interact with the cloud because they have to write a bunch of special goo. So we wanted to avoid all that. So like I said, the rug, 
was where we began. So if you hear me say or, uh, orchestrator or rug, it is the same entities. I use them interchangeably at times. So reference neutron, I think, you know, there's about a billion variants of this slide out there. Um, you know, just to kind of differentiate it a little bit. So reference neutron, it's, you know, fleet of microservice agents. You have layer three agent, you have DHCP agent, you have variants of those agents that talk within each other. If you're running DVR, it's even more agents. But, you know, conceptually that's where it started. And, you know, that model works. Um, and so what we want to do is explore an alternative way, which is what happens if we change this and had and provide some services either in VMs or containers or hardware, you know, without all the agents and, and, and think about something that was a little smarter can, could combine some services out. Um, you know, I authored some of those agents on Neutron and so, you know, it was interesting to look at use case. In this case, what we did is we simplified it a little bit by we have an Astar, the Astara service. Um, Astara itself does not sit within the data path. We'll kind of hit on that a little bit later. Um, it's purely control plane, talks directly with the Neutron server, you know, um, as well as sometimes I could put like a little dotted line that goes down to the message queue. But you'll notice we leave the layer two agents there. Um, a star is a layer two agnostic, OVS, Linux Bridge. Uh, we run on top of other proprietary solutions, um, physical networks, um, it does support those. You know, again, with the Neutron reference, you know, you've got your hypervisors, you might have your, your full mesh, you have network nodes, um, you know, they're providing network services. Whether you have one in the case I drew here, or, you know, tens or, you know, you know, 50 of them, you still at times can encounter problems in terms of congestion, points of failure. Um, you know, you can do high availability with DHCP and metadata, you can do those services. Um, but we want to take an alternative approach, which is what happens if you take those network functions and actually scatter them out throughout. Um, so that if you have, you know, you can run these functions within VMs um, or you could run them, you know, in lightweight services. And so if a particular function dies, you know, for lack of a better term, your blast radius in terms of tenants is impacted is very tiny. Um, so, you know, that's kind of alternate model we were exploring. What does this look like? How is scheduling? And so a lot of times um, in the default case, if you were to download the code in GitHub, it's going to do a one for one, whatever service, um, except for in, in it's going to combine DCP metadata and routing typically are co-located um, on the same box within the open source components. So with that, let's kind of dive in a little bit under the hood. Um, like I said, it's, you know, it's control plane orchestration. It's logically centralized. We have pluggable drivers. Um, again, this is kind of calling back to one of our motivational challenges, which is we knew we wanted to change technologies over time. Um, historically, Hystar has supported appliances that were based on BSD, Linux, um, you know, some proprietary appliances from big network vendors as well have, you know, been integrated. It's multi-process and multi-threaded. Um, I'll kind of touch on that in a second. It actually helps in a number of different ways in terms of scaling. And, you know, it, Astara, we started development in Folsom. It went in production in 2013. So, you know, while the project joined the big tents um, last fall, this is something that's been going and churning and been in constant development for some time. Um, Astara supports dynamic routing, um, both OSPF, BGP. Um, it's pluggable, it, you know, I think the current appliance that we produce for kind of testing is based on Bird. Easily integrate Quagga if you like that variant. You know, it's all and designed from V and designed for V6 from the ground up. Um, you know, we started playing around with V6 even before Neutron had full support for it. It was a nice kind of learning lab. It was a good way to kind of, you know, try out some ideas and see what worked before some of the interfaces in Neutron were baked. Um, and like I said, it's agnostic, so you can run OVS, you can run Linux Bridge or something else. So the Astara architecture, in terms of control plane, if you look on the left-hand side, it's going to be Nova, Neutron, um, you have the orchestrator, um, and then on the right-hand side, what you'll kind of see is what you see like in the data path. So you have at the bottom, you have your physical network um, that can, you know, and then you have your like OVS, Linux Bridge, proprietary. Um, some of the things we've done and kind of talked about in the past, if you've seen previous summits, we've integrated in with some of the switching that supports higher core port binding so that you could, you know, you can do a lot of interesting things with that. That's where you get that kind of 
OTT L2 agnostic kind of shim layer there that, that enables us to kind of say orchestrate if we wanted to work in an environment like where you're running VXLAN within the rack and then your VTAPs, a hardware VTAP with the overlay across the tours, um, standard open stack APIs, and then you got routing, you know, load balancing, firewall, um, VPN. Um, today it supports routing, load balancing, still waiting on the firewall API to kind of get mature enough um, to build an implementation. And so the architecture, Pluggable actually has some cool things. So because if you're running with service VMs, you can upload an image to Glance. Um, one of the things we recently put in in Mitaka was the ability for a tenant to upload an image. Um, and then so you could have alternate images for a particular, say, routing service. Um, because fundamentally, once you plug it into the network, um, you can, I mean, the plugging's generally the same. So you can have different variants of image. Um, it's kind of nice in terms of if you, if you think about a public cloud provider because while you may have lots of tenants, they're not necessarily all the same or equal. And so you might need to provide special images for certain tenants. So that's an, that's an advantage um, as well as its driver base. So like load balancing, HA proxy, Nginx, Nginx plus, um, VPN was rolled in, touched on routing a bit earlier. So internals. Um, we're all Python based. I mean, that's generally what you find within the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, what's a little different is a star, the orchestrator itself, is based on Python multiprocessing. So you, a, a, an orchestrator instance will have multiple processes that all have a master process communi communicate via the multiprocessing internals, but within that there are several workers which will have threads. Um, the nice thing is this gives you two knobs to turn. You can scale up your number of worker, you can scale up your number of processes as well as you can scale up your number of threads available. And the benefit to that is because each of the, th the threads are typically dispatched to manage a particular VNF, if you have a VNF that's hung or you have a VNF that's slow, um, you know, you're only impacting one of the threads, you know, Python's tr traditionally with some of, it, you don't end up with like some of the problems you would have with a ventlet per se where it might hang. We're actually using traditional Python threads. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, they just work. Um, they're fairly fair. Um, you know, not always good because, you know, I mean, Python threads have a consistent bytecode count before they yield. Um, but in, in what we found in production is that was a lot easier, made development a lot easier. Um, so if you take a look on the right-hand side of the screen, what you'll see is at the top, we have kind of like a process, kind of a master process that will spin up a number of helpers. So kind of the big functional blocks is you have like something that's responsible for notification processing. So it's listening from the telemetry coming out of Neutron. And so we're listening, so Neutron as the API service runs generates lots of events from create, update, you know, start and end events and just, you know, a fire hose of events. Um, we have a processor that's sitting there listening and we're listening for the type of event, the ID, but not necessarily all the contents of the event because, you know, if, you ha if you're listening to that fire hose, timeliness doesn't matter. So what we're more looking is, you know, what's interesting about that event stream. Um, so it processes it as rapidly as possible, generates an event internally, which is passed down to a scheduler. And when we say scheduler, realistically what it's doing is it's sharding across the number of available workers to then dispatch. So like uh, the key is um, basically based on tenant ID. And so then it, will and then it will spread that out to a worker. And then within the worker, um, the worker then keeps a separate queue of, you know, say like I need to go work on this tenant's routers. Um, and then we'll further dispatch a particular router down to a thread. Is, and so that rolls down. And so what that does is that if you have a particularly noisy tenant, it kind of keeps the path, but you know, you're not necessarily creating lots of congestion for everybody else. Within a worker, it's basically, we keep a state machine. Um, and some of the events, you know, it's like, is this thing even up? You know, like, so we go, we, and the state machine kind of turns through it. It's like, first thing we kind of do is we kind of figure out what we need to do. Um, so if you take a look at the right, it's kind of like a representation. So when you're using automated tooling with Neutron, you tend to generate a lot of events at once. You, it's not necessary to always process them all individually. You can actually take a look at the set of events, kind of coalesce them down, and then take an intelligent action. So like while you may have, you know, eight events, 
they may all be seven of them, you know, like first one may say create and the next seven may be update. So when you're taking a look as the worker gets to it, its first action is to kind of go through, scan the backlog of events unique to its um, network function it's managing and then kind of coalesce it down and say, okay, I've got one create and seven updates. I can go do a create with a full config refresh and then you're not sitting there wasting extra cycles. Other thing that's interesting about this is, let's say at the back end of the queue, somebody spun something up and then you know they've used it and then as they're working, they decide it's time to tear it down. What we've also found with automation tooling is sometimes you create a lot of update events followed by a delete. And so what we're able to do is peek ahead all the way in and be like, oh, I have a delete event. There's no reason for me to sit there and unwind and run all these config changes for updates that aren't actually going to matter. Um, and then within a worker, we also have an instance manager. It's pluggable so that you could have varying types of instances. Um, you know, traditionally with the star, it's been service VMs, but you could switch it out. Um, the instance manager um, is capable of, you know, talking with Nova. It's, it's the interface where we abstract out, like, do I talk to Nova? How do I boot this thing? How do I manage it? So, with that, that's kind of like within each um, a star orchestrator, but one of the other things about that is you don't really want one node running because what we all know is hardware will fail or somebody will, you know, turn off the wrong circuit. I mean, you work long enough data center, something screwball is going to happen. So how do we scale this thing active active? How do we have multiple orchestrators work together? So within that, um, like I talked about, you know, kind of with the scaling up, we can add more threads that gives us the ability. Within a single a star orchestrator, what we've found through it via testing is that a single orchestrator can easily handle thousands of VNFs. Um, doesn't really sweat, pretty easy to tune. Um, you know, for a while this was also run active passive. Um, you know, they just scaled up, it kind of worked. But for that HA, we can actually expand the set of star orchestrators. Um, we're kind of leveraging, you know, the nice thing about being a part of a big community like this is we can leverage the uh, twos library gives us membership. It allows us to kind of do clustering. Um, you know, it can be backed upon what Zookeeper memcache. Uh, and so as you increase the number of a star orchestrators, we then are also using, you know, hash rings and kind of deterministically sharding the petition, uh, uh, basically sharding which VNFs we're handling. So you get kind of get that active active. I could go through, you know, I can add a third orchestrator you know, I can also contract the set, and it all kind of works. Now, oops, oops, backs, okay. So, like I said, this is implemented using hashring. Again, you know, one nice thing about this community is people have already tackled things like this. So we were able to take the hashring that's been working in Ironic, kind of, you know, take a lot of that code, make it work for our purpose, you know. Um, other thing we also did to kind of make things a little bit more simple is orchestrator kind of really makes no assumptions about the current state of a function is because what you don't know is you don't re you don't always know when you have an event, um, say a contraction event, you don't actually know if the orchestrator is previously managing this network function actually did everything it was supposed to do or maybe it just died or hung or something like that. And so as you change that set, you actually have to go back and go through and ensure that the configuration is up to date, that there hasn't been any drift. Um, it actually expand, it actually simplifies a little bit, expand contract because you're not worrying about, you know, a late notification because if you have a multi-process system, it's possible that, you know, host A is now managing a particular VNF, but the notification actually arrived on B. In this case, we don't really care. You know, the notification will arrive on B. It's fine. It's just going to get dropped, um, but it's not going to be an issue in terms of, how do we, um, you know, how do we process it? Because we're basically going to assume a cold start and make sure that we have a fresh, fully populated config. So within that, within Mitaka, I talked about bring your own network function. Um, you know, you can upload a new image. It's something we're kind of excited about. It's, it's the primitives were put in. I think with Newton, it's, it's, it's really kind of, we talked this morning in one of our design summit sessions, probably talk a little bit more tomorrow about that about how we can expand this, what, you know, what things we can support. Active, active appliances. This was kind of, this was in, um, you know, Neutron proper, and so it just took us a while to get that, so with support for VRP, um, VPN as a service, so, you know, interesting thing is, is you know, one of the little bit differences, um, 
the orchestrator, uh, or not orchestrator, but the appliance here actually runs strong Swan, whereas upstream is more open Swan based or uh, Lever Swan. So just a little bit difference there. Um, and then instance pooling. And so instance pooling is very handy, especially from a VM based, um, when you're doing VM based services. Um, you can keep a ready spare pool. The nice thing about it is you can keep pools of different types. So if you have load balancers, you can keep a distinct pool of load balance of spare load balancing instances versus a spare pool of say routing instances. Um, they're tunable, configurable. Um, nice thing about that is you can do rolling updates and you can pre-populate that pool if need be by growing it, letting it build, and then doing issuing your updates. So that can even make it faster. Combined with VRP, most of the time the tenant doesn't even notice the update occurred. So within the within the ecosystem uh, or within the Astara project, so we have the orchestrator, and then I've, we have a couple other component projects. Um, we have an Astara uh, Horizon, which provides a little bit of integration of Horizon. I'll show that in a moment. Um, and then we have the Astara appliance. Um, so while I said Astara itself is not in the data path. We needed something for testing. We needed something to show how routing as a service worked and that's something we could build against. So the Star Appliance, it's basically a basic router image. It supports BGP based um, BIRD, BPN, DHCP, um, and is able to provide the similar services for metadata um, that you would find in the OpenStack um, in the Neutron version. It's Linux, it's, it's Debian 8.3. Um, pretty simple to build, use this disk image builder. Again, re-leveraging components of the community, what we wanted to do is, when building this implementation, differentiate um, where it made sense, but borrow and consume as much of the output of the rest of the community as we could, because I mean, that's the benefit of all of us being in this big community. Um, so, just gonna make sure. The Astara appliance itself, everybody kind of asks how it's configured. Uh, it's fairly simple REST API, just passes most mostly an intermediate version of the config across. Um, you know, could we have chosen a different, a, a different uh, protocol for support? Yeah, but we found REST was just kind of easy. Um, also made it easier to bring, to, for new people to kind of see what was going on and not have to learn. If you're not necessarily familiar with all the, you know, alphabet soup of varying ways to configure network appliances, um, we thought this was kind of the easiest way. Um, and so typically what you find in interface with the appliance, um, the management network is gonna be wired up first uh, on ETH zero. Occasionally Nova will plug this in a different place. Um, how we kind of counteract that is at boot time, we pass via uh, cloud init um, commands that tell no, that will tell the appliance that this is the MAC address of your management interface. And so from the appliance itself is able to go scan its available interfaces, look for that MAC address and appropriately configure that one as the management network. Uh, typically within a star, it's historically always been IPv6 based. Um, it, just because we wanted to be IPv6 first, it does support v4 um, occasionally. Uh, and that question comes up occasionally. And then the other interfaces you'll find, Heath1 is typically net external network, and then you have two through whatever, which is tenant networks. Um, and then another component is the Astara Neutron project. Um, I'll get, questions about what this is exactly. It's a small um, chim layer, which enables a star to better interface with Neutron. One of the challenges of being an implementation is that sometimes you need to run ahead of where the upstream community is going, or other times you need a chance to experiment and then figure out if this is the solution before saying, hey, let me go write a spec, let me go make changes in Neutron because, you know, some ideas are great, some ideas look good on paper, and then in reality you need to kind of play around with them. And so this is what a star neutron handles. Um, it does provide a traditional layer three plugin that you would standard, you know, that service plugin that you would consume standard uh, and then install in a config file for neutron. Um, and provides a small NL2 wrapper. It was, it was interesting, uh, I was chatting with some folks yesterday evening about this, and they're like, why does this even exist? And part of it is, is for to add some support for some features that necessarily weren't in Neutron currently today, and also to kind of test to see if it's, you know, validate that the plan actually works. And so one of the things we'll hope to get in Neutron is to actually get rid of this ML2 wrapper and push those small, tiny changes upstream um, and, and make them work in a wider array of folks. So, like I said, long-term goal, let's get rid of this thing. Um, it's a very small set of code, but it also, you know, 
for us being an implementation, the closer we are to mainline Neutron in terms of REST API and interfaces, the better. Um, but that's just one of the components that's there. Um, and so I touched on that. So let's, oops. So now the fun part. Um, oops. That won't go away. So demo time, um, you know, let's, you know, picture container ship throwing massive fireballs. I'm usually cursed with these things, so. You know, so on one hand, it's like, okay, hey, this is standard horizon. We've seen this. That's our goal. Um, you know, the horizon interface should be the most boring part. But behind the scenes, what I'm going to scroll here is just kind of give you an idea of what's going on, is the Astar orchestrator is running. Um, it's looking for changes. It's looking for, you know, what modifications are going on um, within the network. So if I were to go in as the demo user, you know, and, I've, and I've, let's just say I've got a simple topology set up. Oop, that did not. You know, so I've got a router, I've got two networks. Um, so if I go in and let's just delete an instance, you know, I'm gonna, you know, workload's changing, I'm, I'm you know, turning, I'm shutting some things down. If you notice, you'll see some motion in the background as a star is reacting to some of these things. I can go through. I can, I can, you know, detach the network from the interface. I can go back through. Oops. I can go back through, connect it to the interface. Um, and you'll see the motions are, and you'll see the actions are going on underneath the hood. And so, you know, that's all the generic. It, what's happening is, is that a star is listening to the telemetry coming off of um, Neutron. It's reacting. If I were to, and then see there's a big config change that's pushed. Now, if I exit out of this, what I can do is just kind of give you an idea of what's going on within the appliance, kind of diving into it a little bit is, you know, it, like I said, the testing appliance is standard Linux. Um, can access it via IPv6. So, you know, I can you know, kind of standard set of interfaces that we're seeing here. If we take a look at the services, it's going to be DNS mask. Um, nice thing about this is that we were able to kind of co-locate a couple of services. So within this particular appliance, I'm running routing, I'm running VPN, um, DHCP. So in terms of resources, a lot of the tenants, um, resource, a lot of the tenant services are all co-located together. You kind of get shared fate. Um, operationally for operation teams that have been running this, it's very easy for them to dive in and then say, okay, um, I need to troubleshoot a particular tenant or maybe I need to go through and, you know, maybe I've got a tenant who like, you know, has an NTP reflection attack going on. It's like, okay, but how can I go through and make a targeted change to tenants to then fix to then fix them on the back end for their network? And so within that, um, like I said, it's standard. It's standard Linux. It's standard. It's just we wanted to keep things as standard as possible. So looking ahead a little bit to Newton, um, this morning we talked a little bit about, you know, I think one of the outcomes is implementing a generic VNF driver. So you know, while we've done routing, we've done load balancing, we've done VPN. Um, those are logical constructs that are available in Neutron today. What we're seeing from some workloads is that there are VNFs that exist that people want to um, wire into, the, in, into their deployment, use in their deployment. They have external management systems, which is fine. Um, so within that, it's just a generic driver that can take that appliance, boot it, wire it, and connect it in with the network. Um, Python entry point support. Nice thing about this is that we can have drivers that don't, that aren't necessarily in the Astara tree that can that a star can then utilize. Um, load balancing just kind of, you know, within the last cycle, they've added a lot of extra uh, support for new APIs and load balancing. And so just as we've been growing the Astara team, you know, 
keeping up and making sure we're matching everything. SSC integration also came up this morning as well. Um, so, you know, join our community. It's growing. We've had lots of new contributors um, in the Mitaka cycle. It was exciting to see all the new faces. Um, you know, my favorite part about the OpenStack community is, you know, while we may interact with people one-to-one -one in person, I always like when you have people jump in on IRC you've never met before and like, hey, I really like your thing. I want to help and let's work together. Um, so project status is on Launchpad Astara. Um, documentation, um, either docs or conda.io is a redirect really for astara.read.docs. Um, and then Freenode and then our weekly meeting is the Monday is at, you know, 1800. So with that, um, you know, just kind of the last little takeaways is we designed it to be hyperscalable control plane, uh, very pluggable uh, to provide layer three and above services, um, all open source. So thanks, questions? Hi, thank you for the presentation. Before coming into this meeting, I was just saying this, Astera, as a wrapper sitting on top of the Neutron, I'm glad I, I came here. So. I see that it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. Mainly just you provide not only wrapping on top of Neutron, you have a stateful machine running in there to monitor what has been happening and maybe the on the northbound interface of Astra, there's a subscription and notification mechanism will be provided from Astra to external systems, I assume. In that sense, what is the relation or how do you tie Astra with the attacker? Because you're delivering pretty much the element management system, mm -hmm. right, EMS, for the VNS. So the attacker is orchestrating all these deployments and doing all these configs. And so it seemed to be that we, these two can be bundled together to offer much more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so I definitely agree that when you start taking a look between a star and attacker, they're both within the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, in terms of relative age of the projects, I think Astar was running a little bit ahead of where Tacker was. Um, and so I think, you know, kind of logical next steps is figuring out how we can work together. Um, one of the reasons why we moved our fishbowl session to this morning is to avoid overlapping with Tacker for that very reason so that we can start, you know, we can jump in and kind of cross pollinate and talk and share ideas about how to better integrate. Because like I touched on, you know, the number of elements that We've either you know used or ideas have been inspired by other things in the OpenStack community, and also integrating in with projects where it makes sense. You know, it's a clearer win for everyone. Yes. Uh, uh, two questions here. Uh, how do you operate in provider networks, uh, kind of an environment? So in a provider network um, environment, it's really no different. Um, we run in provider network environment because from our perspective, a layer two connection is a layer two connection. Okay. The other one is uh, if you have an existing. Uh, architecture with plain well in a uh, neutron deployment mm -hmm. with tenant networks. Is there a migration path to Hurst, uh, Astera? Is there a, so the question is, is, is there a migration path? Um, online migration path in the code we have today, no. Have we written scripts that can do some of that stuff? Yes. Um, Migrations are always a fun thing because every different cloud has a different SLA. So, um, but it is possible to migrate them. It is possible you can, you know, unschedule an instance via the Neutron agent and then spin up a corresponding Astara VM. It is possible to do that and kind of migrate through. Um, one of the things we also want to, you know, possibility it's out there and then really it's just, you know, could we take and leverage the VRP support for HA that's in? Um, Neutron now, and then actually have it fail over into Astara is make a really seamless path, um, would be one of the things as well. So, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>